Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful day. Usually it's been uh, pretty wonderful. You know, the week's been pretty uh, either cold or windy or rainy and snowy. But uh, here, usually the Sabbath is always a nice day. But today we got a little bit of wind, and that's okay because the sun is shining bright. Uh, we're alive and we're well. God is blessing us this morning. Amen. Amen. Um, my name is Randy Powell. Uh, I will be your guest speaker um, for this this uh, this service today. Um, I am not left with any announcements today. Um, I just want to remind you this is a holy day and holy hours, and remember that God is uh, with us, uh, even though. Right now we're few in number. Uh, the angels make up uh, the people we don't see. So uh, let us act as if this is a packed house because it is. Um, um, the wind was blowing. I was up in uh, Canadian, and uh, the, <laughs> you know, it made me think about the people over there in the desert, like Saudi Arabia or whatever. You know, you see them walking and they have their face covered and the sand is blowing. Well, up there, it's real sandy up there, too. And I was just getting stung in the face and it wasn't feeling good. I had to walk backwards towards the wind. My neck was getting it. Um, and my spring had broke on my trailer. Two, I actually had two springs broken. And uh, uh, hauling a transport, um, you know, I... It's, you know, more of a circular looking trailer, tanker trailer, if you will. So it's more aerodynamic, that's what I'm trying to say, than most other trailers. And um, even that was rocking, you know. I usually drive around about, you know, 75. Sometimes I'm going, I'm going 80. And I just had to really slow down all the way to about 60, 50 miles an hour because of the way that it was rocking. Some other people were pulled over. And, uh, you know, grain trailers, so on and so forth. But I'm just thankful that I was able to call upon God um, and have the trust in Him, knowing and have confidence in Him and be bold in Him, knowing that I was going to make it uh, home safely, make it to my destination safely. So I'm just really thankful for the week that I had in the Lord and Him uh, blessing me and my family to be able to grow closer together, stronger together, and to be more of a, if you will, a team and a home for, for heaven. And I would just like to open it up for anybody who else might have a testimony that they want to share this week. My family came from California, but I still had a good time with my family. Yes. Weekend as well. Amen. That's a that's quite a. Uh, drive there from California. Glad they made it safe <coughs> safely during the holidays. Um, are you from California yourself? Oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't seen them for two years, almost three. Oh, okay. So it was going to be, I had my hopes up because they told me they were going to come. You know, it was a for sure thing and then at the end. They, they didn't show up, but um, we still have fun. Okay. Okay. We still had a good time here. All my family is here, basically. Good. My children from Memphis came down. Okay. We had, we had a nice time. Praise God. Praise God. It's always a blessing to see family and celebrate with friends and family. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, 
Uh, now it's time for uh, tithes and offerings. Um, let us remember uh, to give back to the Lord what uh, He has given to us. Um, God has been merciful and gracious to us. And, uh, we'll say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to pray and ask that you would bless these monies, Lord, that is coming back towards you, that you will uh, bring a blessing on those, the Lord's hearts, and those uh, giving what they can, Heavenly Father. And we thank you for the blessing and your blessings that you have had upon us uh, this week and continue going forward until your coming. In your precious and loving name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jessica will come and do the children's story. Maybe we'll sing a little song from uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in the sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little Children of Israel, they came up to the Red Sea, 
and he said, he told all of the children of Israel, he told them to get in the water, and they had to trust God. So they all got in the water, and they trusted God, and then what did Moses do? Moses raised his staff in the air, and what happened to the water? It parted, and the children of Israel they were able to walk through the Red Sea, and they were safe for them because God protected them, and God will protect us too, won't they? Okay, does anybody want to say a prayer? Do you want to say a prayer for us? Okay, go ahead. You want to say a prayer? Yeah. Oh, I to say a prayer. Oh, just hold hands. We're taking hands. Okay. Hold his hand. We'll say a prayer. Again, my name is uh, Randy Powell, and uh, I just had such a wonderful week, and I'm glad to be here this morning. Um, I was talking to my wife um, earlier this week, and uh, we were talking about just in general, we know this couple, and they, uh, uh, they end up retiring this year. Um, They had a nice, nice homestead, nice acreage. They had barns and um, a shop, and um, nice, I would say, five thousand square foot home, a cabin and a pond, and uh, five kids. Um, of course, they all grown now, out the house, and um, it was very interesting just the way. Um, uh, they downsize and they're not the only people I've known has had to downsize in the later years and during our, our lifetime and the people we know as we begin to get older as we begin to live life and have kids and our kids um, get older uh, we get you know a big home a bigger home to accommodate um, our families and then after our families get older, um, they leave. Um, and was, they were uh, blessed enough to have sold that home. Uh, sometimes people are not able to sell their home. And the home pretty much goes to waste or their property goes to waste. People begin to bring trash out there, um, you know, just doing the most. Um, not really considering other people. And, um, you know, the houses that we see, at one time, they used to be uh, modern day houses in their heyday, nice newer homes. And then eventually they began to deteriorate. Our cars, you know, our nice vehicles when we get them. I got my vehicle used and it was a nice vehicle. And over time, especially nowadays when they're spraying salt on the road, you know, it's going to speed up the rust. Cars are going to get rusty. They're going to get old. Um, there's nothing that we make that's going to last forever. You know, um, they, I, I've seen some wonderful carpenters uh, build some nice, sturdy homes that are from the 1920s. Um, 
and they're really nice looking homes, you know, still up to date, but eventually they're going to come down. The OAIG building here, they just had no use for it. And every day, or excuse me, once a week, uh, when we're on our way to Tulia, uh, by the way, we're from the Tulia Church. We live here in Amarillo, but our membership is in Tulia. Um, we passed the AIG building, and you know, they spent however much money building that building, and now that building is gone. That is not God's plan for our life, and our us building our spiritual home, and our character. It is meant to last forever. It is God's will that what he does for us lasts forever. God has always wanted to sustain us. To sustain us not only economically, financially, but also sustain us health, health-wise, spiritually. He wants to do all for us. And that is not hard to believe because of the cross and that he died for us. And it is a blessing that anything that God does for us will be permanent. Nothing that God does for us is a short-term temporary fix. Everything that God does for us is a permanent seal it's stamped, it's done, it's for us. Whether he blesses us with um, character-wise, uh, more patience, you know, we got kids. So patience is important in our family, you know. And that, that bit of patience he blesses with, however much it is, that's, that's permanent, it's, uh, it's ours. And we're to take that and use that and increase in it. But let me tell you something. What wars against God's sustainment, sustaining us, is ourselves, our own sensuality. What I mean by that is those five senses that we have. Um, smell, and touch, and hearing, and seeing. But the number one sense that I believe is the more I would say the most prominent sense that war against God the most is our taste our appetite and being now God has blessed us with these senses let's just wait a you know double back a little bit and understand God has blessed us with these senses but the overindulgence and the intemperance will lead us away from the sustaining blessings that God is trying to bestow upon us. I want to turn your attention to the children of Israel. The children of Israel came out of Egypt and God, it was, it was God's plan and desire for them to be an army coming out of Egypt. It was God's desire for them to not just get that little strip of land that they possess now, but to actually conquer, to go forth conquering and conquering, nation after nation after nation. And God was going to bless them along the way. And we see that starting in Deuteronomy 8.3. If you open up your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy 8.3. Deuteronomy 8.3. Let us say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given us this day, Heavenly Father. I'm unworthy, Lord, to break down this Bible, Lord, so therefore we need your Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, to impress upon our hearts the things that are so much higher than us. We ask that you would make these things simple and plain. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. 
It says, I'm reading from the uh, King James Version. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did they, neither, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doeth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doeth man live. See, it was God's plan. You know, the children of Israel was in Egypt hundreds of years. And like my wife was talking about, it was time for them to go so they can be in the wilderness or, or go to a land that they're able to worship and serve God. And so God raised up Moses. The Pharaoh was hard hearted and stiff necked. And of course, you know, he brought plagues. And that last plague, after he, um, the, which, uh, before, uh, just before uh, Christ's death, the Jews celebrated the Passover. That, that last plague that brought about the, the Passover, Pharaoh's heart was soft enough for them to let the people journey into the wilderness. But his heart had hardened again. And the people, the people of Israel, uh, after taking riches and treasures from uh, the Egyptians, began to journey and they came to the Red Sea. And there at the Red Sea, um, God was going to work a miracle. But as I said before, here is God sustaining the children of Israel. They're sustaining, uh, God is sustaining them in all, uh, in all ways possible. And God told them, God told them in Exodus 15, this is a little after God parted the Red Sea. We're going to go forward a little after God parted the Red Sea. And he told them in Exodus 15, we're going to be in the book of Exodus. He told them in Exodus 15, 26, he said and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to my voice, to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. It's imperative for us to understand that this promise is for us also. That we are supposed to be in good health. That is God's promise to us. He is telling us, what is your name again, sir? Carlos. Carlos? Yes. He is telling Carlos, personally, Carlos, if you would diligently hearken to me, you will be healthy. And you will not have the problems that they did in Egypt. You will be in good, full health. That's your promise. He said he is saying that to you. And he's also saying that to me. And it's imperative that we understand this point. It's imperative that the children of Israel had to grasp this. But the number one thing that stopped this from happening was that they were giving heed to their sensuality. Giving heed, not, not having temperance in their daily living. And we see that in Exodus 14. In Exodus 14, in verse 11, the children of Israel is here at the Red Sea and they're they're, they've came to the to the world, uh, to the to the border here, and God is telling them through Moses, get in the water. They had to have faith to get into the water. Now the panic broke out because here comes the Pharaoh and all his chariots, and now now they're panicking. But guess what? God sent a pillar of fire, like a tornado, a tornado of fire and lightning. To, to, to block them from getting there. Okay? So think about that. 
Think about that. That's the first thing that they've seen. Well, of course, the plagues. Don't get me wrong. But that just, just that God is protecting them. That God is ha, has favor for them. And look what they says. Look what they say to Moses. As God is protecting them. Look, look, look what they say. They say Exodus 14, 11. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us uh, dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt. In verse 12, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Now that's a mass disrespect, but God is long suffering. See, these people have been slaves just a few days ago, they were slaves. Their mentality wasn't right. They weren't able to think right. And, of course, we know what happened. God parted the Red Sea. They got to go through the Red Sea. And in chapter 15 of Exodus, is about the song about how God is a man of war because the Pharaoh chased after them. And they walked on uh, dry ground. But the Pharaoh chased after them. And, of course, the, wa uh, the walls of the water closed in on them and drowned the Pharaoh and his army. Such a marvelous thing that uh, God has done for them to overcome a demigod. Because you got to remember, Pharaoh was looked at as a god. And to show God his might and his strength and his power, it was undoubtedly that God was with them. God was with them. And so after walking... They began to get thirsty, rightfully so. They were walking, didn't have any water. They were thirsty. And so they complained and murmured against God. And said, God, we don't have any water. And God blessed them with water. Well, the water was, was bitter, right? And he made it sweet. And he did that. And then, now that they got something to drink, they begin to get hungry. And you've got to imagine that God has got them like on a detox. Because here they've been in Egypt. They've been worshiping like the Egypts, uh, Egyptians. excuse me, And they weren't able to worship God. That's what God said specifically. They need to come out of Egypt to be able to worship me the right way. They need to come out. They weren't going to be able to worship God in Egypt. So God had to put them on a detox. And I don't know if you ever get on a detox, been on a detox, but you get a little hungry. You know, uh, you get a little, uh, some might say, uh, grumpy, if you will. You do. It's not fun. It's not fun to fast. It's not, a, it's, it's not a fun thing to do. It's a good thing, but it's not a fun thing. And especially to be fasting and walking. So you kind of understand, right, that these people are a little, uh, they, they, they did see these beer miracles, but you kind of understand and you, you, you kind of realize like, okay, I get it. You know, God hasn't fed them. And what they do, they begin to complain and murmur. And look at the words, the similar words that they begin to say to God. They say in Exodus 16, 3. In Exodus 16, just a few pages over, Verse 3, And the children of Israel said unto them, of course he's uh, talking to Moses and Aaron, Would to God we ha had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to full? For ye have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now that's not why God brought them into the wilderness, to kill them with hunger. But yet they're a little delusional. They're a little off. And what did God do? Did God, did God blast them? Mm -mm. Did, God, did God punish them? No. He began to explain to them the man of heaven. And manna rained down from heaven. And they began to understand that it wasn't going to fall on, on the Sabbath day. They had to get a double portion. And they knew they was able to get a double, double portion because it, it rot and became spoiled. Um, if it came down on Monday, they got to had to get it before noon or else it was spoiled, so on and so forth, and they weren't able to keep it for Wednesday. 
God was sustaining them, blessing them with sustainment. And it was sweet, and it was healthy, and it was a simple diet. And it was, you got to imagine being hungry, how they felt. They felt a burst of energy. And yet still, wanting the flesh pots of uh, Egypt, God sent, still sent them quail for them to eat. God made it very clear that he was going to sustain them. God made it very clear that he had their back, if you will. As you see in chapter 17, the congregation continues to move. Remember, they're walking to the land of Canaan. They're walking to their promised land. That's where they're going. They know they're going there. And yet the people continue to murmur and complain against God. In so much that they were threatening to kill Aaron and Moses. These are their sensuality taking over. Notice what they're complaining about. They're complaining about food. They're complaining about water. Temple things that God has been providing for them. And yet they're still, anytime the stomach, the stomach rumbled or the, the mouth got dry, they wanted to complain against God. Because they could never control their sensuality. They could never control their senses. They refused, they refused to have temperance. In this case, with their taste. Going back to Adam and Eve. It was hunger, uh, probably not hunger, but it was taste, gratification of eating whatever fruit that was to disobey God. And so much that it all took a real toll when they see right, right here, they were journeying to the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. So they were in between that time as they're constantly complaining, 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 walking and walking, walking and complaining, complaining and walking. They get to Mount Sinai. Mo Moses go up to Mount Sinai. He's getting the law, the Ten Commandments, and just instructions. Uh, and also remember, too, uh, his father-in-law came. They set up a government so Moses can deal with the people so they can function. A government under God. God was their king. And God is setting down rules and regulations to help them live a righteous life. That's, that's what's going on here. And yet, from this, this is going on from uh, Exodus 16 all the way into right around to Exodus 30, 32. And God is explaining just wonderful things to them. And what did the people do? They got anxious. As we see in Exodus 32. 32, 6. They got anxious. And it says, And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. What were they offering to? Their idols that they threatened. They was going to kill Aaron. They threatened to kill Aaron to make this idol, this golden calf, and whatever else they made. And Aaron, in, in, in fear, and trying to reason with these stiff necks, said, well, give me your gold earrings and your gold jewelry. Because of their possessions toward these things, he figured that they would be like, okay, I don't want to give up those things. But they willingly gave it up. Instead of crying to the Lord, uh, this, was, this was a stain on Aaron's record right here. One of the first stains. He has two stains on his record. This is his first, his first stain. And and <laughs> here he makes this golden calf. And he says this is going to be a celebration to God. He was talking about the high God, but that wasn't going to work. We, we can't celebrate the way we want to. We can't worship the way we want to. We got to worship the way God told us to worship. And the moral 
The morrow came, the next day came, the people rose up, brought burnt offerings to their gods and said, these are the gods that brought us out of Egypt, the ones we just made. Just totally intemperate, totally allowed their sensuality to take over. It ain't no telling what they do, that word, what they were doing. That word play is, is to make sport. And you have to understand, these people were making sacrifices and bringing their burnt offerings. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with... Um, Aztec worship, um, but they were chopping heads off, sacrificing heads, chopping chopping off heads to appease the sun god. And that type of form of worship actually comes from Egypt. But which, which that Aztec worship? Which that? It's like down in, kind of like in the southern South America, uh, the pe people, the people, uh, Aztec people. Um, that, that, that form of worship where they would sacrifice, they were cutting off people's heads, um, sacrificial worship that they were doing to appease the sun god, that, that, comes, that comes from Egypt. That was done, displayed in Egypt. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with soccer. And of course, you probably are. Uh, the first time soccer was being played in the world wasn't these type of worships. What they would do was they were actually playing for their lives. And during these sacrifices, they would cut off the head, wrap it up, and I guess in a leather, in a leather uh, bag, or what, if you will, and kick the head around, you know, make a goal. They was actually playing for their lives. Uh, just a weird way of form of worship, you know. So it ain't no telling what the children. My my point is, I'm trying to explain to you and take your imagination. It ain't no telling what they were doing when they were sacrificing and playing these sports. But what we do know is they were gratifying and satisfying their senses, you know? And of course, God was doing wonderful things. He stopped what he was doing, told Moses to go down. These people were doing the most. And Moses pleading with God, that they don't, he don't blot them out. He said, blot me out. And that's honorable and that's noble, but God told Moses. There in 32, you'll find God told Moses, he said, he who sins against me is getting blotted out. You know, it, it was wonderful what Moses said, but he couldn't save him. So what they were doing was a big deal. That idolatry was a big deal. And we'll see later on, he, he plagued the children of Israel for that. But yet God was still with them. And as we go to Numbers 11, we see that during this time, God is back with them. They're starting now to build up the tabernacle. They're building the altar of, uh, they're building altars, and they're building the temple of God, that, that mobile temple. And God is laying down the, uh, the blueprint to Moses, and he is having people build them. People are bringing their offerings, building this uh, mobile tabernacle. And right here in, the, in Numbers 11, it was time to move again. Every time the ark would move, they would move. Every time the ark would stop, they would stop. So the ark went before them, uh, containing the two tablets. It went before them. And every time it stopped, they stopped. And every time they, it went, they went. But notice, notice their sensuality in Numbers 11. It says, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Wow. Here they are again complaining to the Lord. They Remember, they complained as they were coming out of Egypt, but God bore along with them. If you will, they, their, their, their minds were cloudy. God was bearing along with them, but now... Folks are getting played. Now, folks, folks are, folks are getting burnt. Their, their spirituality wasn't able to discern, wasn't in, dis, wasn't in discernment. Their spiritual mind wasn't able to discern what God was doing because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so their temple once was ahead of them. All they could think and all they did 
was serve the belly God. That's all they were doing. And of course, as we see in Numbers 11, God brought, because they wanted the flesh meats. Notice how he says, uh, notice what they say. And, the, and it started in verse 4. It says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Now, I just want to explain to you that these people were going to go conquering other nations. And all they could worry about was the garlic, the cucumber, the leeks of onions that was going on in Egypt. They could not get their mind, they could not get their mind off food. They could not get their mind off eating. And they, as I say, we got, we, we got to eat these things till we were filled up. They, they loved to be gluttons. Couldn't get their minds off of it. And now, so much to where they're dreading the man. They say, oh, this man of God. Ah, ah, tired of eating the man. What does God do? He brings them what? Quail. And he says, you're going to eat quail till it comes out your nostrils. And guess what? The people still went naked. People still went naked and died. Died while it was in their mouths. Yet God still bore with them. God was still merciful with them. Out of all, out of all these things, God was still merciful with them. Now it was time to go into the land of Canaan. Now it was time to go into the promised land. Was the people ready? People weren't ready. Their sensuality had made them unfit. They weren't able to discern what God was doing. In so much that when they went and sent, sent spies, they brought back what? Grapes. Big grapes that they were uh, carrying on trees. You know? Probably as big as my head, I guess. You know, And they weren't ready to go into the land. And when the, the, the 12 came back, 10 of them said, we can't take the land. There's giants there. Even though God promised it, there's giants there. Two, Joshua and Caleb said, we can take the land. Folks, their sensuality had them so, so uh, corrupted, so deluded, so in doubt, that if two said, uh, we can't take the land, and ten said we could, they would have still heard the two and said, no, we can't take the land. And during this time, Joshua and Caleb was like, no, we can take the land. Let's take the land. And then they picked up stones to stone them for some reason. Like they were being blasphemous for saying that God has promised us this. And of course, God came down. And he made them a promise. He said, I promised that I was going to, your fathers that you was going to the land, that they were going to go into the land, that their seed was going to the land. But I promised that seed's not going to be you. You're about to wander 40 years in the wilderness. Because they set up captains to go back to Egypt. Just weird, constantly wanting to go back to Egypt, never wanting to essentially go to heaven, if you will, by their actions. In theory, they wanted to come go to heaven because they walked out. But by their actions, they never wanted to step foot into the promised land. It was their sensuality. It was their, it was their, their, their unwillingness it was their unwillingness to give up self to go into the promised land. And when God sent that plague, as we've seen in 32, God promised, we got to remember, God promised in Exodus 15 that He wasn't going to, He wouldn't bring those diseases upon them. 15 chapters later, I mean, it could have been, what, two weeks? I, I think they were only one. It, I don't know. A couple of days later, here they got a plague on them. This shows us by, as Peter says, they are an example to us. This shows us that we cannot do what we want to do. We can't watch what we want to watch, hear what we want to hear, smell what we want to smell. 
you know, taste what we want to taste and think that we're still going to be able to follow God. Those things do not get us into heaven. What we eat is not going to get us into heaven. You know, that's not what's going to get us to heaven. But it can sure keep us out. It can sure keep us out. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And God has came, Jesus Christ came, to set us free from the bondage of sin. Set us free from our own intemperance sensuality. Intemperate sensualities. Intemperate senses, if you will. Overindulging in whatever it is is not, never a good thing. Yet we're living in a world that says, indulge, 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 indulge. Do what you want to do. Live how you want to live. That doesn't work. God told him ten times. Ten times. I put up with you and that was enough. If he did it to them, Carlos, and he, put, he said it was it, do you think it's going to be the same for you? If he cut them off, do you think he'll cut you off? I think he'll cut Randy off. I think he'll cut Randy off. Because God is a just God. He, if he cut them off, he'll cut me off. Therefore, by his strength, may, us, may we overcome ourselves, overcome our selfish desires, and follow God by his strength, the way he has told us to follow him, there in his word. Christ has come to set the captives free. And after we have been set free, let us go and continue to set others free. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you have given us this seventh day. Lord, we just pray and ask that we can overcome our sensuality, Lord. Overcome the desires that Satan has put before us to lead us away from your wonderful blessings, to help blind us from seeing how you have blessed us and seeing how you're trying to work a wonderful work in our lives. Give us strength, Lord, to conquer the greatest battle ever in our human lives, and that's ourself. In your precious name, holy name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.